We built a house. It took forever, and it's still under construction. We started in 2012. So tonight I'm going to tell you about this house, and then we're going to spend a little time on the mechanical systems, radiant floors, ground source. Ground source can be cheap. And then we're going to talk briefly about the thermal mass and a few observations about living in a passive house. We've actually been living there, you know, even though it's not finished. And that's been interesting. And then I'll tell you what I said. This is a model of our house. Those are the, our neighbor's houses. So we're going to go through this house part fairly quickly. It's the back side of the house. We didn't actually put the garage here, it's actually here. But I like this design better. <laughs> so we've got quite thick footings. And uh, the concrete walls are right at the edge of our footings. So we started construction in the basement with the actual foundation walls. The walls that hold up the house are the wooden ones. The concrete ones just hold the earth back. It's a double wall house, and it's about 1,500 square foot uh, footprint. The walls are 24 inches thick, R80 in the walls, R110 in the roof, and R50 all over the basement. At the time, we were directly targeting the passive house standard. Unlike uh, some other projects, we had the luxury of saying, this is our house, this is our, our we're doing the design. And there's no need to consider any sweet spot other than getting the standard, which I think is a sweet spot. We had a lot of help from Fourth Pig and Terrell and a number of other architects, Solaris at that time. And uh, it, was, it was really nice, fantastic uh, group of people. We sheet the house in one by 10 uh, pine sheeting planked diagonally to get a very vapor open exterior. And you can see we've also been uh, applying liquid applied vapor barrier to the joints and seams. So the interior walls being sheathed, they're the, the real airtight uh, assembly of the house. And the interior system, which is a regular platform frame, uh, had sheathing going right around through the roof and through this. This section here is a cathedral uh, roof as well. So we have a little elevator shaft here. This is uh, the main floor. In the basement, we have a raised wooden floor. And uh, <coughs> what we've done is tried to create a thermal separation in every part of the house. So um, the insulation from the roof comes right down and underneath the basement floor. So a raised floor in the basement is a little unusual. We thought long and hard about how to, uh, how to do that. And at one time, we had ping pong balls in the bottom of our basement floor assembly to provide an airspace. But we ended up using the ping pong balls are surprisingly expensive. <laughs> so we ended up using. Uh, wood lattice and uh, landscape fabric here, uh, two layers of rock sole, and then we got a great deal on two by 12s, so the, the basement looks like this now. At that time we had some tours, there's a blog, and we had, uh, we had a lot of visitors. The, this is the attic. We had a lot of help with the insulation from Greg and Green, Green Saver. <laughs> And uh, so we had a, a ton of cellulose, but not as much as the previous photo might indicate. We put a bridge in the attic so we could walk through. Um, I was concerned that some of the cellulose in the cathedral section would, would settle down after time, so I wanted to be able to go in there and inspect it. Here you can see the guy putting it in, it's, it's quite thick. So uh, this is just a, a brief video for fun. I was really glad that we decided to go with the steel elevator shaft. It allowed us to put the elevator shaft in the middle of the staircase. Residential elevators are often designed to be supported by 
by significant diaphragms, the floors. And um, this allowed us to put the elevator shaft n not so close to floors, but in the staircase. It's going in nicely. Anyway, since we were, <laughs> it was $5,000 uh, to get that frame made in Barrie, and I think including delivery, so it was quite economical. This is how the house looks now. <coughs> we used uh, regular porcelain tiles to do the cladding. We had these, whoops, we had these clips made in Scarborough uh, to my design, and they worked out well, but they had zero adjustment, as you can see. So we had to come up with a, quite a jig to, to position them very, uh, uh, with a tight tolerance. Cheryl used to joke that she would check with us every Christmas. And we do have drywall now. <laughs> this is the, the living room. And that's our house. From now on, I'll talk about the mechanical system. And it turns out, with all this insulation, and, and we have the passive house windows, U-value 0.6, SHGC 0.6, our heat load ended up at approximately two hair dryers. No farts required. <laughs> we took a kind of a, as much of a fresh approach to mechanicals as we could, and we went overboard on some things as well. Here we're actually showing some interesting things. This is the heater we used in the house for a couple of years, situated right there, and it worked fine. 4.8 kilowatts. The heat load was three kilowatts. This is the ping pong table we used to generate heat. That worked well too, in lieu of the, the other heater. This is a welded aluminum duct. We, being a mechanical designer, I can tell you that I hate duct work and I hate regular duct work. So we looked for a lot of different solutions. I had a, a slide of all kinds of ductwork of different types that we surveyed, but um, I took it out. Not much time. So we, we welded a bunch of, a bunch of ductwork, and we got some great prices on stainless tubing on Kijiji, and we used couplings from the plumbing industry and uh, turbo machinery industry. The, you know, turbochargers are so popular on cars now. We have also um, heated radiant panels, and th these gray areas indicate where we installed hydronic radiant panels. We actually have them on windowsills in f seven locations in total. This is the main floor of the house. This is the second floor, so uh, a few more. And we have a, a fan coil here as well. I, I saw this space above the, the bathtub, is that what you call these things? And I, I thought, oh, it's perfect for a fan coil. And it ended up being quite a tight installation. Somebody down the road's gonna love servicing that. <laughs> and this is, so this is above the, the uh, this bathtub insert here. Or, shower insert or whatever. Here's the fan coil on the other side. This is an interesting feature. We found that this fan coil does have a coil in it. It's not just a fan. So we can actually draw wonderful moist air out of the bath bathroom any time of year. It's not always desirable, of course, <laughs> but we have this condensing dryer and uh, it dumps heat in the room as well. <laughs> So it actually becomes a significant heat source for the house. All that warm vapor, which is lovely in the winter, and uh, in the summertime, we can also draw that vapor out, but condense it in the fan coil and get rid of some of that moisture. These are our radiant floors. We used uh, self-leveling concrete. It, it definitely needs this mesh to reinforce, to, to prevent cracks, especially being so thin. These are just about an inch thick. That's a half inch PEX there. The windowsills were afterthoughts. I, 
imagine that inspectors would want to see heating elements in each room, and I tried to think how I could do that. So we have heated windowsills with hydronics, um, and to make them as thin as possible, I took a long look at different types of tubing, and I still think uh, stainless tubing would be a, really, a very good choice for hydronics. I don't know why people don't use copper as well. There seems to be a kind of mythological prejudice against metal tubing in, in hydronic systems. Yes, PEX is wonderful, but it takes a lot of space. When you're you know, talking fractions of an inch, that matters. So uh, this was stainless tubing from the brewing industry. It was a 24th thou wall, 3 eighths diameter, and it was terrible for bending. So I stuck with the copper, but I would like to experiment with that in future and we'll, uh, and possibly also for some of the ground source. This is a, a self-leveling concrete with these copper tubes embedded in the windowsill. And uh, it's just about 3 eighths of an inch thick at, at that point. And then we added a, a very thin finish, 1 eighth stainless plate and we're very happy with the, with the results. Chinese uh, manifolds work perfectly fine. I've tried the Italian and the German ones as well, and I don't see any reason to pay extra for them. Video two. Thank you. This is a Three Musketeers here. So these are the boreholes we put into the basement. We have 22 of these holes. And uh, we welded an extension onto that auger. It happens that we have quite dense uh, shale, I think, earth under, under the house. And drilling was a pain in the ass. It took us a whole week to, drain, to drill these 22 holes. And there, we only got about five or six foot deep on, on each of them. So this was an afterthought as well, and we had to move a whole bunch of gravel, six inches of gravel everywhere, to get that PEX in. Here we're heating up the PEX to give it the tight radius to shove down the holes. The nice thing with the PEX is we have no joints, everything is continuous right up to the mechanical room, but um, it's not quite the right tubing for geothermal work. It has the oxygen barrier on the outside and that gets damaged quite easily. But other, I mean, the, mechanically, it's perfectly fine. But this is a, a, a case where I think stainless tubing can be quite a, good, quite a good option. This is a little corner of the mechanical, uh, sorry, the electrical room. And we just have six loops, very, very low cost plumbing manifolds, and a couple of accessories here. And we're supplying a little commercial style air to water heat, sorry, water to air heat pump that boosts into our HRV system. This heat pump, I got it brand new on Kijiji for 300 bucks, and it's totally useless. It's an, it's an R22, and I need to replace it. Our three guys working for a week, I, I give that about $2,800. If we use this real heat pump from China, which, which is a two-ton heat pump, it's a water-to-water, -water, we got it freight on board destination for just $1,000 with a one-month delivery and a few accessories and the, uh, a little bit of labor uh, to, do the, to do the system in the room, I get only $6,000 or so for a low-cost ground source system, good for about one ton. We've tested the system a number of times now, and we consistently get an output of one ton. If, uh, if it wasn't an afterthought, it could have been slightly cheaper. Here's the connection to our duct boost system. One of the things that duct boosting, the strategy never seems to mention, is that a damper is needed on this side so that we're not sending our lovely tempered air out of the house and only sending it into the house. I don't have a damper there yet, uh, and I do, we have to put one in. We also have a rainwater collection system and uh, you might have noticed that the Chinese heat pump was water to water. It's because we do plan to interface with this rainwater tank and uh, draw heat from it in, in the winter and dump heat into it in the summer. 
It happens to be that when you have a very low energy heating plant, a very low energy heating plant on the order of three kilowatts or, or, or so, what happens is it seems that you need to, to design not just for the design heat load of the building, but you need to design for the thermal mass. With 400 square feet of radiant floor and using you know, various calculations, the specific heat of concrete, we basically end up that it takes about 11 minutes to raise that concrete uh, by about one degree Celsius. It's a very simplified calculation. There's a few things left out, but the general idea is that the thermal mass is a significant obstacle to uh, system responsiveness on low energy systems. It's not the end of the world as we know it, but uh, we can address it with a larger heating plant or um, a, large, a large thermal storage at low temperature. One of the reasons for this thermal mass issue is because we don't like to keep the heating system on during the daytime. We get a, a ton of sun. The sun is responsible coming through the windows for some two-thirds of our energy budget. And even this year, we've only turned on the heating system one night so far. So, so some ob observations. We found that uh, living in a passive house, you can live in luxuriant high humidity. Except high humidity causes uh, any unbroken thermal bridges to present themselves. Another thing that we notice, which has nothing to do with our passive house, but I like this picture, is that a lot of heat is leaving through the plumbing. This might look like a flower. It's actually our plumbing clean out. And you'll see that in the wintertime, there's a bunch of condensation and moist air coming out of there. Who knows what we eat for dinner? And here, another observation. Unless you've lived in a passive house, you may not be aware of this, but there's a lot of condensation on the windows. It's just on the outside, not on the inside. This happens on lovely, moist days in weather similar to today. It can also happen on the inside when you have high humidity and very cold weather outside, despite the window manufacturer's claims. So what I've said, I hope you come to our house one day. And uh, we'd love to show, show people the place. But radiant panels can be thin. We got hydronic radiant panels in half an inch on those windowsills. Ground source can be low source. Can, sorry, low, low cost. Thank you, Fee. And consider thermal mass when you have very low energy uh, heating plant designs. And may all your houses be lovely.